The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of The Engine Room. And in fact, uh, this particular episode should be called The Engine Room on Tour, as we are now in sunny Maitland, um, up the highway from uh, Sydney. A very convenient trip. I've uh, dragged my sound guy, Kieran, all the way up and, um, you know, bucket list stuff, an hour and a half with the sound guy um, sitting next to you on the way up. And why we're here is very special uh, practice um, and quite an interesting guy. Um, I would like to introduce everyone to Gil Gordon, who uh, runs and owns um, RI Lower Hunter and Newcastle. G'day, Gil. Welcome to the engine room. Thank you, Andrew. Pleasure to be here. Now, Gil, I'm pretty g'd up about this because, quote unquote, you said, I'm going to uh, struggle to hold you to the hour. So um, for those of you who are listening, maybe put a few more steps in that walk uh, or maybe drive around the block a few more times. But um, Gil, maybe if you could just give us a bit of a feel of um, your backstory, you know, how you've managed to uh, get to where you are at the moment um, and in that journey, the good, the bad, the ugly, that would be awesome. Thank you. I started uh, in the industry in 1994. I, at the time, I was a computer programmer, ex-engineer, mechanical engineer, and computer programmer. I, I got very interested in money because, to be honest, it's, it's an intimidating subject, and I tend to lean into things. So I didn't come via the classic sales route of insurance, which very quickly helped me because I had to convince myself that what I was doing for the clients was the right thing. And anyone that knows me knows that I can do a spreadsheet that'll choke a horse in the first five minutes of meeting somebody. So I'm deeply into the analytical stuff and that's been a feature of what we do. Interestingly enough, this business is one of the few that love uh, engineers. We have a lot of engineers and highly, fairly high caliber engineers from the, from the Hunter region because we can go blow for blow with them into the numbers as deep as they want and eventually they, they stick. And, and Gil, when did you kick off? What, what year? Uh, September 1994, 20th okay. September 94. And, and, um, computer programming, uh, before 1994, which is valves, switches? What are we talking? Is it, <laughs> I, I sort of got a vibe of the, uh, uh, the Star Wars kind of, um, computers. Is that Mate, what we're doing? You're not far wrong. When I'd studied at university, it was definitely punch cards and pencils. That's how I learned to program on a computer. And bit by bit, we got to the actual screens. Awesome. But it's that, yeah, it's been that long. Awesome. So 1994, a lot of engineers, which which is a whole other kettle of fish that we're going to talk about because mm-hmm. uh, normally engineers, actuaries um, and uh, architects uh, are the big triumvirate of tough nut clients. Give them to me every day of the week. I love them. Okay. Well, we've, keep, keep going. Keep telling us this story. Let's, let's go through the whole horror story. All right. So uh, because I, I, I was never a natural salesperson, so I just needed to convince myself that what we were doing was the right thing. And it turned out that engineers love that. Uh, so we, we really built this business initially off the whole Telstra redundancy. So a lot of those guys are very bright manual oriented guys but they're very technical and so we have hundreds of Telstra clients in the practice uh, it's moved on from that now but the, 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 the genesis of this business was Telstra we 
we started just before the Asian bond crash, I think in 1994 with a pregnant wife and uh, not enough money, but it was one of those moments that I think that every business guy or girl has paid the price. And I remember those early years, which was a little bit scary, but we got through it. Very much a, a family-oriented uh, practice, this one. Uh, we got five uh, advisors, five senior advisors, four local partners, very heavily family oriented. And that's how we run this business. We've been very active in the RI advice community as well. The Proprietors Advisory Council have had a lot to do with Kaplan over the years and, and developing a lot of the training framework within the RI world and the industry. So I, I've tried very hard to be an advocate for the advisor perspective on things. And I think most people in the RI world know me and you know, I frustrate them, but they, they listen. So perhaps we've been successful in that. So you kicked off a lot of the – at the back in the day, it was Telecom that became Telstra mm-hmm. for those out there. And um, and there was large redundancies there. And I think um, potentially those uh, people were also were given some Telstra stock, which would have helped them um, considerably. Um, yes. And so this is in the Newcastle area or – Predominantly the Hunter Valley, Newcastle okay. and, and the Lower Hunter. We have clients in Tasmania, clients in Brisbane, of course, like, like most practices. But because we're a fairly high-touch kind of practice, we tend to keep local. Uh, but – yeah, so it's predominantly the Hunter Valley, Maitland region. And Newcastle. you mentioned you, you didn't come through the, the standard life insurance. No. Does that mean that you were doing full comprehensive plans uh, with cash flow analysis spreadsheets from the get-go? Yeah. And what was the early doors sort of uh, software that you used uh, back in the day? Mate, I wrote it myself. I wrote my own spreadsheets. There was very little modelling that we used. Uh, it's, uh, to be honest, it's a fair while ago. I don't quite remember, but I, I know we had the three-page fact finds and that the client had signed them with barely any information on them. And, uh, you know, the I, what was the precursor to statements of advice? There were records of Customer advice. Customer advice records. Customer CARs. advice records. Yep, the yep. cars. Uh, it was mainly about super and rollover, and very quickly we lent into Centrelink. And the only way to do that was to become an expert in Centrelink. A lot of these guys are being made redundant and I had to model things myself. I had to write my own tools and that shaped the kind of conversations we had. So instead of being guided by the tools, I wrote the tools to have the conversations that were happening in the office. How how were your soft skills? Because if you were dealing with a lot of Telstra redundancies, looking back, you're probably thinking that was a great windfall for for the individuals and the couples that came in. But at the time, these are people quite often that had spent their entire career in this one organisation. At what stage did you think you were predominantly counselling who happened to have a spreadsheet? Mate, I, I, I'm a people person like most advisors are. We're, we're here because we love the work we do, not because we're after the money. I haven't met anybody that's that brutal about it. It's good to be paid for what you do, but you, the calling is very strong in the advice community. I the, the, the biggest transition there, I would say, was when we went fee-for-service in about 2007 when we, Why? What was the catalyst? Well, honestly- that, that was pre- the, the the requirement to do so yeah and what what was the what was the the moment the moment was me waking up one day going holy crap the whole industry's gone fee for service and I'm the last guy in the country well, that wasn't the case no I thought it was though and so because I was embarrassed about how late we were to the party or so I thought we stuck our head down for two years. I did a cost to serve and identified what needed to be charged and then I'd have to go to the clients and say, look, our fees need to go up. And then the clients said, Gil, we love dealing with you guys. If you can show us that we can afford to pay this and the money will last, we're happy to pay. And so I built a tool called How Long Will the Money Last, which is just a projection tool, and it started to quite weirdly shape the conversation because instead of talking about super and strategy clients started to talk about their lives they wanted to retire they wanted to renovate the house they wanted to buy a car help their kids travel and whatnot and bit by bit that became the conversation we have in the conference room not the conversation about technical skills or strategy to the point now where we we rarely get deep into strategy in the first in the discovery meeting at all the the whole conversation is a, a 10-3 now conversation which we Every advisor in the business does it this way, so it's an engagement conversation. So, sorry, let's say so 10 three, 3 now. now. Maybe play that out for us, please. Okay, that, that came from Scott Fitzpatrick and Brian Fitzpatrick's lead advisor group. And a shout out, particularly to Brian, who's been a great friend of ours and a great help as we've grown the business over the years. The, the idea is where are you now? 
where do you want to be in 10 years and where do we have to be in three years to be on track to the 10-year goal? Oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah, so something that you can actually achieve. Yeah, it, it, we, they, they work with what they call the four L's, called the live, love, learn and legacy, and that's a fairly intellectual concept. So we re- rewrote that into a model we call people. So there's a catch line of anything that you see that I've written, and I've written articles online and a fair amount of stuff on LinkedIn, if anyone wants to have a look, is I finish most things I write with good advice puts people first which is an obvious and no-brainer, but people's an acronym. It stands for place, employment and career, offspring and family, passions and hobbies, liabilities and expenses. So that acronym shapes a conversation. Tell me where you want to live. Tell me what your career, how long you want to work, whether you want to change, go back and study. Who do you love and what's the impact in your life? Tell me about the things you're going to do, motorcycles, renovating your house, travel, debt and expenses. And we've found that, we've, I've lost track, that the conversion rate's phenomenal when you say, well, get to your money, tell me about who you are and who you love. And if you put that centrepiece in your engagement and your ongoing conversation, um, these days in a review, we might spend three or four minutes on, on investments. The rest of it's on the people. And Gil, the, the, the people acronym you just used, that was you? That you, 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 you brought thought of that? Yeah, that took a little while to develop. Oh, we can give credit to, uh, G Gordon, um, in, in, in the, in the notes there. And that was brilliant. That was really good. And, um, you know, the real art is to, to talk expansively about people's wishes, desires and loves and whatnot, but have the rigor of consistency within your practice to make sure you're doing it the Completely. same way at the back office. And yep. by, by giving yourself th- those kinds of tools, um, it means that it's not subjective, especially as your, your practice evolves into other advisors. But, but heading back to yourself, so you, you went back, uh, you've, you've, you've kicked off, you've built this business, you've t- set out, started. Uh, uh, you went fee for service in 2007. Yep. Okay. Um, and from my personal experience, I, I, I went 2002. Um, and, uh, the clients are the easiest component. Most of the time, it's, it's actually convincing yourself and your own team. That um that this is they're willing to pay and it's surprising like the amount of times advisors have come out with these Cheshire cat looks going they did pay me for my time yes it's weird yeah. isn't it it's a great thing is I'm a huge fan of fascia which I think is standard six it says your fees need to be fair reasonable value for money first thing I did was dive in and say okay what does it cost for us to do what we do and that was the beginning of saying okay we need to do things consistently and I've redone that cost to serve a dozen times in the last fifteen years and. You're right. The clients go, okay, I understand. Now, it helps to put it in the model that they see on the screen in the conference room. Absolutely. But you've got to believe in yourself. And I often say this in, in speaking gigs, in a room full of advisors, how many of you would pay full fare for your own services? And it's really interesting to watch people squirm. Most of them, you can see them go, oh, I'm not sure. Well, you need to understand. That. Wild. Rubbish. You'd either pay for it or you wouldn't. My problem here is I asked one of my partners, Chris, to t- take me on as a client, and he said, no, you're too hard work. <laughs> you wouldn't – I don't want you as a client. Well, I actually um, – I, I recently, uh, about three years ago, asked one of my great friends and uh, used to be my colleague to take me as a client. He goes, only if you become a wholesale client. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm like, okay, okay, it's okay. But um, – um, and uh, throughout your your career, so it's, um, has there been any – any people that have, have, have been a changing doors? I mean, you mentioned the Fitzpatrick, Brian. Um, any other people that have, have coloured the flavour of how you've got your practice today? Oh, of course there are. Look, the, the, the coaching that Fitzy brings to this practice is terrific. He's a team coach. He's a um, head psych or head team coach for the Cookaburras, and he's very he's a specialist in the financial planning industry to make as the team grows you've got dynamic issues that you need to work through uh that's great my partner chris is an absolute legend he's very different to me he's a steady steady rock and he calls me on my bs uh i couldn't speak more highly of the uh, the AFSL with RI advice. Joseph Ayrad, our, our practice development manager is a legend anyone that knows him will tell you that shout out to joe joey is Everyone's family, right? I, I couldn't speak more highly of him. Peter wants to be a terrific bloke. He's invested heavily. Uh, very excited about um, the community I'm a part of, NRI. There's a lot of people out there, that friends of mine like Jeff English, that have been very valuable. The The industry itself is a terrific crew because we share. It, you know, that 
perception that we might be in competition with each other I've never seen. No, it. no, we're only in competition to be efficient. Yeah. That's, that's right. really it. And, yeah. and and um and look the whole ensemble uh, premise is the positive evolution of financial advice and you can't have any of those words if there's no sharing. It's it's an interesting dynamic. Some people like to hold information back when they're engaging with new clients. I tend to go the other way. I tend to tell them as much as I can legally tell them in the, in the first interview. And what it does is that if they, if they like you, they see the complexity of what we do and they go, I just need to find someone to help me on that journey. So I've always overshared and never regretted it. You're either learning or you're earning, but you're never losing. And um, so you, you're residing now in the Hunter with your family or have they grown up or where, where, where are you at? Yeah, well, I live 500 metres from the office here on a few acres. Uh, for everyone who's commuting an hour and a half to work, um, send your hate mail to the usual yeah. address. Well, it can be a burden. Like on a good day, it takes 90 seconds to get to work. Some other days it can take two and a half minutes. We can cut this out. <laughs> <laughs> no, we also we also have – we've got three offices, one in, in Newcastle. Right. We've got a satellite office in accounting firms. We have, we have three strong centres of influence and we've got the big office here in Maitland. But to be honest, we've got two major offices in, in Newcastle and Maitland. Uh, so it's a it's – a, Maitland, the Hunter, is a terrific place to live. People that move up here very rarely move away. And um, it's, it's always fascinating watching Sydney people come up here and look around and go – what is it? This this place is undiscovered, and there's a reason. Yeah. yeah well, it's um and and look, what I what I um might might sort of switch gears in a minute is talk about you know your actual practice per se. But before we do that, as um as I walked into uh, your quite beautiful offices, um in a refurbished looks like a couple hundred 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 year old hundred and seventy year old hundred and seventy year old dwelling. And first thing I instantly asked is, did you buy the building? And um and and you did, and uh, it's. Being one of those things that um, I know that a lot of financial planners themselves spend a lot of rent over their 15, 20 and 30 year careers um, and it was something that was quite prevalent but um, do you regret um, buying the building or, or is it, are you happy with it? No, I'm happy with it. Uh, the it, It's solid. It's something you can rely upon. Yeah. You own it. And the, the idea was that People get used to coming to a certain location. I was a friend of mine's a property guy. He said one of the things that he as a landlord does is he gets someone used to being there and then he ups the rent. This is, uh, this building is the way we want it to be. It's very warm. It's got fireplaces in it. Clients come and don't leave, which is exactly the vibe we want to create. The sense of they're coming home, not that they're coming to a glass and chrome place where they don't belong. So, no, I love the building. Love the building. My wife threatens to kick us out and move in here as a house. So. Well, you've achieved that warmth, warmth. But, no, I just wanted to add that because we're talking about the engine room of how things are working, but we're also talking about how advisors over their careers position themselves as well because mm-hmm. um, – uh, advisors sometimes are, are, are like plumbers of leaky taps, and they, they they think about their own their own uh, financial position um, definitely last, and uh, it's good to do that. Now, with your particular um, practice or this practice that we're currently in, mm-hmm. um, how's it structured? You know, maybe give us a feel for the org structure. Because sure. I mean, you're one guy, but you're not the star of all the shows in this business. Not, not anymore. Yeah, for a while there it was, but we've got five. Advisors, uh, four CFPs, one senior guy that um, he could do it. He just doesn't want to. Got a general manager, Kate, who's been terrific. Uh, two senior client service managers, and this is a, a really strong concept when you're looking at an engine room. The need for the advisors to not run the business. Advisors are the talent and they're often the head of things, but our client service managers genuinely run the business. And we've got, they've got two client service support staff and we've got two VBP in, in our team in, in the Philippines and they're instrumental. They've been fantastic. Uh, we've got a, a, I think there's three people work part time in the practice as well. So very much these days in a difficult, uh, recruitment environment to actually give that lifestyle and flexibility in the workplace. So we, we have RDOs, roster days off, we have work from home policy, um, some part-time as they say. Well, well I'll, I'll, I'll touch on the, the people side in a minute. How long has Kate been in that role? Kate's only been with us for a year and a bit. Yep. Now, if we've had about 160% growth in about four or five years, yep. uh, the majority of that's organic. So a bit of acquisition and then we introduce our client service offer and the clients just fall into it. That whole people thing and the, and the live modeling in front of the clients just is incredibly engaging. So we, we find that we've grown quite dramatically but very steadily on the back of systems and Kate 
was brought in to make it run better because I'm a good guy, but I'm not a great manager. And so, look, the, the premise of the engine room, um, and, and, and so Kate's been a year and a half um, here, and the, the premise of the engine room is to talk about how uh, practice managers have, have run the business. And in fact, mm-hmm. um, I recently spoke with a lady, uh, Belinda, and she's been in that role 15 years. But I'm also really keen on 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 working with the the, the founders and quite often they're the the advisors on what made them get that role and and you know how did they justify it to themselves and when you started down that path so so when did you start thinking about appointing someone who was running the operations of your business? This probably goes back to to the current growth trajectory. It comes back. About four, four and a half years ago, we. So there you go. So you've, that's so you say so you, you you made that decision four years ago, and things have been going pretty well since. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the, but let's keep keep going on why you did it. All right. So the, there's a couple of things here. I'm I'm the the guy that's good on his feet in front of people. Uh, I tend to be quite creative with problem solving, but I rely heavily on my partner Chris, who is the steady guy, who is very much in the governance and and templates and tools and. File note templates sort of space. The other thing we did, and it was in hindsight a terrific decision, was to hire a lady named Corinne McKenzie, who uh, she works for a local firm now, but I tell you, she's a legend. Uh, real shout out to Corinne. She built, at the time we had three separate teams of advisors, and I assumed, because I'm a dummy, that everyone was doing things the same way. Were they geographically spread? Yeah, no, no, no. Yep. They were working out of Newcastle and Maitland, yep. so we alternate. Everyone alternates between the two okay. sites with, with one exception. Uh, and we hired Corinne to standardise things because we were looking at VBP and we said we need to get standardisation here. So very quickly found out that each team was doing things differently. <laughs> surprise, like, surprise. Yeah, we've been in business 15, 20 years. Well, how can this be? Well, guess what? You know, smart people. You can run a business with excellent people or you can run a business with excellent systems. Far better to go the, to the latter. So Corinne built a whole work frame management system in x for us. We'll call her the Henry Ford of your business. We'll call that. Yeah. Now, I've got to admit, I was terrified at the time because what if the team didn't like the system she built? Or what if they employed the one that wasn't yours, Gil? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I, yeah, exactly. But they took to it like a duck to water. Beautiful. And if I said, no, we're not doing that anymore, they'd walk out the door that afternoon. So this idea of getting your workflow management right in threads in X-Plan uh, is, is, it's not negotiable. So, so what's the structure now? So do you have a pod system? Um, do you? Broadly speaking, yeah. Yes, we've got – effectively, we've got four advisors. Yep. I actually don't have any personal clients. I float around like a subject matter expert and they dial me in for agents. And so if you do plan. see a client, you're co-creating that 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 plan yeah. with, with yes. one of your other practitioners. Yes. Say Chris, for instance, as yep. you're inferred. Chris yep. or Steve okay. or Paul or yep. Ryan. Okay. Right? And so they'll wheel me out as a subject matter expert, particularly on estate planning and aged care, and also difficult decisions if this if you're talking about asset protection and structures. So I guess you'd call me the old fart that uh, is a subject matter expert. But the advisors, the four teams, run their own client base. They have two senior, two client service managers, so that's two advisors to each CSM. Yep. And then there are four CSOs either in Australia or offshore. And so they're executing. They're, they're, they're implementing. Yep. And they're making the phone calls. Yep. They're doing the thing, the research, and yep. preparing the ROAs and S and you know uh, SOAs get done offshore as well. So by the time you do the headcount, it's almost a one-to-one support for your advisor. For each know? advisor, yeah, yeah. and yeah. they get a half a client service manager, and their job is to manage the talent, if you want to call the advisors, because yep. advisors can be uh, very smart, very capable, and very frustrating to work with, myself included. So. And maybe just um, uh, give me a feel for the type of clients that you have now. We are predominantly an over-50 shop. We have a bunch of wealth accumulators and we're working hard on that at the moment. We need a risk skill set to be be built properly. We've got the skill set, but it's not been a focus. So anyone from 50 on the pre-retiree into retiree and ultimately now as our client base is aging towards the 75, 80, 85, we've, we've developed a suite of services in aged care and estate planning suitable for the elder client. And it's something I'm calling elder advice. You know, the lawyers love to talk about elder law, but there's a very different set of challenges for people on the shiny side of 75 
to, to the early stage retirees and it's a totally different skill set and it's very lucrative. And also the gateway to the next generation of clients being their kids that they, that they get used to talking with us on mum and dad's dime. So it's, it's a, it's a good place to work. It's just a different skill set. About five years ago, I was at a conference and, um, I think um, someone from JP Morgan out of, um, New York, um, addressed us and they, uh, they sort of said, well, we are now categorizing the clients, you know, usual pre-retiree, retiree, but we've actually got a whole division for over 80s. Um, and uh, we're, we're now no longer treating them like we're treating the people from 65 um, mm. up um, because, as you say, it is different. And maybe what I'd like to do after I talk about the sort of the, the nature of the practice is really really hone in on, on, on your passion, with it, which is estate planning, because mm-hmm. I'm of the belief and my, my history was that um, those those older clients – um, the best way to to main, maintain your practice is ultimately to get referred down to their their, their, yep. their children, who ultimately will be the recipients of good financial planning advice yep. that you've done, so that the next generation of financial planner, um, or alternatively, you know, general manager, whoever else is a stakeholder in this business, views this as a as, as a real continuity rather than rather than an endpoint. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. People have been talking about intergenerational wealth transfer for the last 30 years that I've been around, never seen it. What there is is intergenerational advice where mum and dad need help and the kids are the ones that are actually leading the process. Get them in for two or three years as we go through aged care or whatever. They get very comfortable with competent advice and then when mum and dad pass, we pick up a well north of half. The, That's right. the clients, they, they and they, they're very good clients too. They, they often come in with substantial super of their own plus their inheritance. So it's uh, it's been a very good place, very rewarding as well. I often to, think to the best there. way, um, you know, for, for wealthy retirees to to give a gift to their kids is actually to pay the fees for their first year or so of of, of quality, um, you know, unbiased financial advice. Yep. Yep. I think that um, you know, giving them. Uh, giving them fish is is definitely not as uh, powerful as teaching them how to actually fish. So, agreed. Um, agreed. I, I'm, I'm, I would love that to be something that's a thing in in financial advice. That that um, because I do interview a lot of people, and I, and I think the split is um, with with the the the, the fallout of of, of uh, advice the last ten years. The split really has bias towards retired people. Mm-hmm. It's about seventy. 30, and I actually think that's a fib. I reckon, you know, revenue wise is about 90%, 10%. I would have thought so, yeah. Um, and that's, that's great, but, um, it's not great for an aging, um, an aging business model. So, you know, having a real ability or, or making it common for the 70 year old, um, uh, couple to bequest, you know, financial advice to their kids should be a thing. Mm. Um, well, I mean, you, you've got to have a problem. That the, that the client wants solved. So if you're, if you're a 45-year-old and everything's going well, it's hard for you to make the time to come to see the advisor. If you're a 45-year-old and mum's got dementia, they're knocking on your door. They don't know what to do and they need someone to guide them through it. And I've had three or four cases in the last two weeks, simple cases and incredibly complex cases. And what you're doing is solving problems and you get, you get to be paid for that if you do it well. But you've got to focus on people before you focus on product. This is one of the things I love about this space. It's it's not product advice generally in the older client space. It's it's services. It's it's Centrelink. It's aged care. It's age p- estate planning. All of this is a service, a non non product advice service. And look, you're 15 years deep into fee for service, so you've mm. refined you, you know your ability. And I often think that also, you know, no one bats an eyelid when a tradie comes out and says I'm going to do a cost plus 30 percent. Mm. And I'm going to make the 30 percent. So you know, I think we are getting there. Now back to um uh, your 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 not um, your model of, of your lead advisor. Mm-hmm. They've got those types of clients. In a second, I'm going to ask where the clients come from. Um, you mentioned you had satellites and whatnot. Um, how, what's the role? When does the advisor or the AR's role uh, stop and when does the engine room take over in, in, say, for instance, taking on a client? So pragmatically, client calls here. They, the client service team book a first telephone call with yep. the advisor. Yep. For that, 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 that briefing thing. And the, then they also book a, a first meeting, a discovery meeting. Yep. So the advisor will sit down there. There'll be, there's a task thread kicked off from day one. Yep. So the advisor gets a series of tasks and they click complete and take their file note, moves back to the client service team who do their bit, yep. then comes back to the advisor. So it bounces around like the ball. Ping so, pong but you're ball. already getting the client service team involved in the relationship. Day one. With the client. Day one. Yeah, I think that's clever because. 
um, it's hard to wean the clients off, uh, you know, the, the advisor post. It's the, the earlier you introduce it, I think the better it is. Completely, You're a team. Yeah. Completely. I mean, I signed a new client up yesterday uh, and we introduced the client service team as the people that manage the process. And, you know, a bit of self-deprecating. They don't trust me with matches, that sort of stuff. And I'm not kidding. My daughter, Kate, works for me. And Katie has lectured me three times this week about making diary appointments in my own diary. She said, you stuff up the system when you do that. Don't do it. Don't, don't even try it. Just to send them to us because they have a series of threads that kick off. And we lean incredibly heavy into that. And just as a number, maybe I'm jumping ahead. Ever since we engage with VBP, and one of the great things about VBP is you, you're forced to standardise your handover. So I said to one of our advisors, Steve, a couple of years ago, and he picked up a yellow folder, which was a review folder. And I said to him, mate, who, who did that review prep for you? He said, don't know, don't care. And what he meant was, I know what's in it. I know that the quality's there, and it really doesn't matter who does it. Well, you getting the model team. I'm getting, yeah. right? And what we've noticed since we've got that standardization, right, and VBP gets a big shout out for this, that our advisor numbers, our client numbers per advisor have gone up by about 40%, and accordingly, our revenue per advisor has gone up by about 40%. So basically, we've just been taking on more clients without needing to hire more staff because we simply do more with less time because the system actually works. And now, it's customized to this practice. I'm not saying it'll be perfect for the next guy. I, I think it might be good, but what we did was we figured out what, how we wanted to run our business and then we put a system in place and we created massive efficiency and it had a direct impact on the profit and the turnover, and uh, by extension, the value of the business. And look, good to he- good to hear that that that's a positive outcome of, of that of that association. I think it also coincided with with COVID. So you've had the you, you you've you've engaged an organisation that 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 has made you get more efficient, and at the same time, we've had this reality that um, we need to have uh, clear instructions because we might there might be a world we don't sit next to each other for a period of time. Absolutely. And uh, look, I've seen that 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 rising tide really mm-hmm. positively affect um, advice practices, and mm-hmm. um, and the other thing is. The, the engine room in a business, and it's interesting that you've already jumped into the, 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 the increase in profit and whatnot. Where I see uh, the businesses driving their value is the advisors are what they are, okay? And they just want time and the confidence of what they say in a meeting gets done. But you don't, motivation's pretty easy. Just, would you like to see more clients? Yeah, I love clients. They're almost like all puppy dogs and I was a CFP for 20 years and, yep. and I like clients, like signing things and it makes me happy. The real value driver and EBIT driver is that, that current bunch of people in your Australian office who were just doing things that are, that, that they could be better and they could be far more engaged with the client. Now, although mm-hmm. they're not licensed, they actually can still build that relationship. And mm-hmm. I think that's what you're inferring here is that, that your team here in, in Maitland and Newcastle are, are doing a lot more touch points with the relationship, yep. which has enabled you to go from, from a, a 40% increase in, in, in clients. So what, what would your, um, advisors, uh, how many family units, I think is the cool thing to say, would they advise? Uh, the, the, technically, we have about 3.7 full-time equivalent advisors in the practice. So I float around as a, as a troublemaker. Uh, but the, the numbers have gone from about 120 as an average to, depending on which team I'm talking about, between 150 and 170 clients per advisor. Great, great. And look, that's um, uh, for those advice practices out there that, that are sort of in and around that sort of 80 to 90. And we're talking, we're talking, you know, you, you're definitely not a, a low net worth business. Um, you, we would have in the Hunter Valley, there's lots of wealth, right? And you mentioned mm-hmm. being in engineering and also mining mm-hmm. and anything to do with that, there, there's significant wealth. So it, these, these, those 160 uh, people that you're doing full service with, um, so that's the cash flow, the investment. Quite often, you might be doing some post-retiree mm-hmm. um, work. Do you do much life insurance, given the nature of the client base? Honestly, no. Uh, Would you like to? Yes. There you go. And I don't it, normally ask that. I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> the The reason I say yes to it, I mean, we're we're very happy with the over fifty five model. But the and and I guess as a call to action or whatever, if if someone has those skills and wants to be part of a well run business, we're very open to talking to that kind of advisor or anyone who runs their own business, because we we've recently. Well, not recently, over the last few years, we've built three or four really strong center of influence referral frameworks 
so partnerships. And to be truthful, it's working very, very well. We're drowning in, in new client leads right now, which I know is across the industry, but it's, it's going particularly well now. So maybe let's flesh that out, right? So um, you've, you've obviously increased your client base by a couple of hundred clients oh, over yeah. the last couple of years. Um, how did you build these um, uh, referral networks? By being good at what we did. <laughs> are, they, are, they, are they in like industries? I think you mentioned you've got three satellite accounting affiliations, is that right? Uh, yeah, we've got three accountants that yep. refer to us. Yep. They know about each other, but uh, effectively what they're doing is I have a client with a problem, I want to give you my client and yep. I want to know they're handled well. So it, it really is a trust and competency-based relationship. We do pay them a referral fee and that's more out of just to, to be truthful it's a respect thing or it, or it also means that they know that they're not the only accountant you know, they can't assume that you're going to get all the referrals because different accountants have different skill sets and, mm-hmm. and and they want different sorts of clients mm-hmm. so I, I think you know paying a cost of goods for a marketing is actually part of running a business totally but what we found is that that, that fee is actually not very important to them they, they like it because they're in business but the, the dominant reason, uh, and thinking of the, the latest firm locally that signed up, they, they had a relationship with a Sydney-based advisor that just kept letting them down. And the clients had come back to them and go, you told me to go, that person, he's, an, he's a Muppet. So when they come here, they, they have a lot of confidence that they're going to be looked after here. And this is critical, <laughs> that the, it's not the advisor at that moment that makes it work, it's the client service team. If your people in the back room are prompt with the return phone calls, doing what they say they're going to do and just honour the commitments they make, you just get referrals like stink from centres of influence. Because I know when we talk about referring out to lawyers and, and risk specialists and things, the girls don't talk about the advisor. They talk about the, the client service manager behind the scene going, we love you know, Lindell, we love Judy, because it's the back office that they love more than the advisor. Well, guess what? That one comment means you've got a business and not a job, Gil. That's, oh, yeah. that's, that sums it up, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, so, um, we, and in relation to, um, the, so you've got these, you've got people coming in through word of mouth. You've got mm-hmm. uh, other people there. Um, you're looking to refresh your, your older clients. And have you got any strategies that you, you know, you're oh, a yeah. thinking guy? What well, maybe, and maybe touch on your, the elder advice and, and you've built some software that I'd love to hear about as well. Sure. Yep. So I mean, that, that's a, that's a big question, Roxy, but the, the first thing we did is as our clients aged and we're in a fee-for-service framework and because we do this people 10-3 now thing, we're always looking three to five to ten years ahead of where they are to see how their numbers look and that's how we ended up in aged care advice. It's also when we went fee-for-service, I was looking around to create a differentiator between what we now call our silver service and our gold service mm-hmm. and that's where estate planning for life came in. So if you, if you genuinely break the nexus between product and advice, you end up going, okay, I'm being paid by the client. What problem do I have to solve for them to keep paying me, which is the professional model? And we found over and over again that they were worried about their children. They were worried about the, 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 their evil son-in-law or their daughter-in-law or the kid's marriage or the kid's drinking problem or, or the grandchild's drinking problem. That's and, all just one client, everyone. Oh, mate, I can tell you that's <laughs> true. Uh, I could, I've, I've already written one book on this, actually. I don't know. It's, it's over there, Roxy. It's called The Bugger Went and Died on Me and I Don't Know What to Do. Oh, we are definitely putting that in the links. Yeah, take a copy. I'm looking at it now. That's it literally for everyone. I'm, I'm looking at a book that says The Bugger Went and Died on Me and I Don't Know What to Do. Now, that, that book, and just to tell you the truth, I wrote it because a client bullied me into writing it. Her, their son had died without a will and left them a hell of a mess, tax, de- tax office debt and all sorts of things, and you're reading it on the back cover there. And I told them they should write. They became an incredible advocate for estate planning, and I said, write a book. And I said, how hard is it? Just tell the story. And they said, well, you do it for us. And I, I couldn't get out of the room. They wouldn't let me out until I promised to write the book. And it's such a powerful conversation when the clients look at you and they don't care about their money, they care about their children. So how are you going to protect their kids? Because the average retiree is now worth $1.2 to, to $1.8 million with two point something kids. Each of these kids are picking up five, six, seven hundred thousand bucks and they don't like their son-in-law. How they, and I've got three daughters. I'm, I'm protecting them. 
It's a shout out to yeah. Gil's um, uh, uh, sons in laws. He, he does still love you. No, no, I don't have any son in laws yet. <laughs> so, um, look, I'm going to go off piece. Um, I'm, I've got this book in my hand at the moment, and, and I'm re- on the back cover. 45% of Australians die without a will. And, and I would hazard a guess that um, of the 55% that have a will, um, half of them have really bad or expired wills. That'd be true. So, let, let's just, uh, let's just uh, if picture this. Um, this is on the back. Please let us bury our son. Patrick and Simone were in shock. Their son, Dave, had just died in a boating accident. He ran a small electrical contracting business, owed money to the ATO, and had a large mortgage. They knew Dave didn't have a will, but they didn't understand what that meant for them as administrators of Dave's estate. Their first task was to bury their son. However, his new girlfriend, Jane, still in shock, barred them from entering the house. No, you can't come into our home. We were going to get married. Patrick and Simone were now scared. They were in some sort of family court dispute, and all they wanted was to get the clothes with which to bury their son. That's the starting point of your book. Yep. Awesome. I um, it's it's people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care in financial planning. So um, yeah, I definitely do a shout out for that. We'll we'll put that on. So um, and that was uh, how long did it take you to write? By the way. Oh boy, uh, honestly, about six months. Uh, it's it's about a dozen stories that are either I just took the names out and changed them, or it's an amalgam of a couple of stories from complex small business <laughs> through this, my my mother and father in there actually as stories, and it, it's it's like a, a bad relationship when you're writing a book. Initially, it's all fun and passion. Over a period of time, you get a bit bored with it, and then eventually, you just want rid of the damn thing, but you can't let it go because you got the history with it. So it's it's published. It's on. It's available online. Uh, if you want to look at the website, estateplanningforlife.com.au. dot We'll include all this in the links, Gil. You can you know, pre- prepare it. yourself yeah. to be on Oprah yeah. very soon. It's. I tell you what, Roxy. I love the work here because you're you're helping people with their deepest emotional concerns and they will pay you. So if you look at the estate planning offer we have in the practice, first thing, if we're going to sit down with them and explain that we've got to dive in and understand their family problems and then we've got to get a lawyer in to do the legal documents. So we charge a fee for that, never less than $1,100 and often $2,200 or $3,300. So just to for clarify, facilitation. you're charging a $1,000 plus GST fee to facilitate yep. the estate plan and then you bring in a, a lawyer to execute the yes. legal side of it. Yep. So all we do is Free. basically collect information and, and give it to the lawyer. Yep. Uh, then... We'll proof the documents to make sure they've got the names and addresses right. But, you know, it's a good working relationship with a couple of law firms that we have. Uh, I like it when they come into our boardroom, though, because it feels like we are delivering the service and the, the, you, the client feels very attached to us. The next part of it, once the wills and, and powers of attorney are done, along with the, the, the binding death norms, we capture the information in something we call the information that matter record. It's just all the things that the family needs to know if someone, if that alpha person, be it mum or dad, is no longer able to, to, to share it. That's a, that's a process. Then after that, we have a, what's called a crisis management plan, which is a living plan, which gets updated each, well, to be honest, every couple of years with clients so that they know what to do, who to call, what questions to ask if dad has a stroke or mum has a stroke or dies. And the, it was, it was quite, strange when we developed this in around 2008 2009 i thought it would have traction for a year or two and i'd have to come up with something new to give to clients guess what it didn't never gets old their world changes they move houses they change insurance companies they change where their investments are and as the client gets older into their 70s and 80s they get more concerned with not being a burden on their kids not less so we have never had anyone disengaged from the estate planning for life service the clients love it because it's about the people they love and it's about the things they need to not be a burden. And it's a non-advice service. I wish I'd met you uh, 20 years ago, Gil. Uh, um, my, my practice that I, I founded an Announcer, um, we, we were very passionate along the same lines and we even started a safe deposit service in the, uh, the big, big safe at Westpac in Sydney. <laughs> Where we would run um, their documents mm-hmm. and have a list of their documents, everything from uh, uh, marriage certificates to baptism certificates. That one comes in handy. You baptize your child, and then you know, twelve years later, you want to enroll them in the local Catholic school, and they're like, "Show us the evidence." Yeah. Um, and um, we we started charging um, for that something like sixty dollars a year or something like that. And I think Is that we, all? 
just for the safe deposit. Um, but I think we end up with three and a half thousand of them. <laughs> Not a bad little cash flow. Yeah, yeah. The, the safe wasn't the thing. You know, at the time, the safe was two thousand bucks a year or something. But, but what it was was peace of mind. So, yep. Yeah, but what I might do is, um, that's really awesome, and then we're going to include some links there, and and I'd like to talk more, and maybe we can do a whole other podcast, um, just into the, you know, the, the state planning because we need it as an industry. There's going to be a, a lot of people that need to to really work on the intergenerational wealth transfer. But whilst we're talking about um, tech, what, what's your tech stack in the in the practice? Uh, we're, we're fairly vanilla, um, very, very cyber security aware, which was quite interesting. It had a lot to do with the drafting of the cyber policies in RI advice. Uh, but we use X-Plan and quite heavily. We could always use it better, but I'm pretty confident we're doing okay. Chris Neal in particular is an expert in this practice, and I, I can't speak more highly of Chris. He's been instrumental in the efficiencies we have. Chris knows how to program. He's, he, he writes threads and he uh, uh, templates and things. So we're, we're heavily into X-Plan and the RI implementation of X-Plan is very, very handy to have someone like that. You need Because it. there is consultants, but that's a, a cost. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they don't really get. No, no, you've got to be. Some get close, but they don't yeah. really get. Yeah, if you're in the room, and Chris has done this terrific work lately on uh, our file note templates, so I can do a full review with a client, and I'm, I'm a bit old school with this. I like pieces of paper in front of me, but I can tick and flick the file note in five to seven minutes as a full handover, and that's including switches and withdrawals and things that often fall out. And it, it's, added, it's just created real efficiency. So we use X-Plan. We uh, are still a heavy user of uh, Excel in a lot of the things we do here. And uh, particularly if you, we're probably not going to go there, but the whole cyber cybersecurity side has been a big focus. For the last two years, we've had a lot of audits and a lot of penetration testing and so things. So you've got your password management. Oh, yeah, last pass. Yeah, yeah, last pass and yeah. uh, two-factor authentication and everything. Yeah. All of that's good. Uh, we also use heavy users of the, the Wealth Central system uh, through RI. It's, uh, it's a terrific system for creating that engagement, that whole 10 3 now, people first thing. If you can explain to clients what their life's going to look like, and I think all good advisors do this, they actually start to do some coaching and forward planning with clients and say, you're going to be able to have what you want. Doing it live on the big screen in front of clients is life-changing for Ex- them. Especially when they can change the nuances yep. and, and have, have it play out in front of them. and. <laughs> Um, you know, quite often when you talk um, about engine rooms and financial planning, we're, we're talking very much about the machine and a lot of people lose sight of the user experience, which is now called UX. Yeah. Um, but not everyone wants to absorb information auditory, some like visual, some like the feeling. So there's definitely clients um, who you have to have face-to-face meetings with because yes. they're, getting, they're getting the feeling of the meetings. But um, other clients are, are very happy to have a phone call to your auditory and some just want... Um, the the visual, but what I've learned over the years is that if you've got a couple, they are not the same. No. So people don't marry themselves. There's a whole thing I do on that. And so if you've got the multimedia methodology of pre- presentation, and, and and you know one of the criticisms of of compliance is it's a very visual um, uh, only method of of delivering information. Totally. So if you're doing that, then you you're missing out on one of the two people, and um, you know surprise surprise when they don't engage as much. It's a it's a long conversation because obviously all the governance framework that we operate within is product related. Yeah, it actually, it's like if you take the time tech. to read, it's, 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 it's it, you read the the legislation that we're governed by, and you're thinking to yourself, this doesn't sound like something that I'm involved in at all. You know, yeah. even when you get your own license, you look at that, and the bullet points yeah. are, you know, it's quite it's quite weird, not putting. Well, it's it to me one of the things that frustrate me. The and 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 we're not a big user of managed accounts as an example. We use paper based models. Yeah. So let's let's flesh that out for a second. What does that mean? And and do you have a platform that works for you? Yeah, we've got a whole pricing and platform policy here. We've mm-hmm. done all that that work, and FASI requires it, but so does the licensee. So we've our our ideal client is a delegator. At the moment, it's an over fifty delegator, probably with somewhere between five hundred and one point five million, uh, who just wants to go fishing. Right, I could tell you any number of stories of clients that have walked. Not a metaphor, actually fishing, everyone who's listening. Yeah, or golfing or whatever. Uh, but I've, any number of clients have come in thinking it was going to be a technical, dull conversation, and we don't have that. 
sometimes seriously we forget to talk about the super funds and things and we've got to bring them back and say, hey, we need to talk about what your objectives are around here. But if you can dive into that, that the idea of modelling the next 25 years of their life, they will love you, except for the 5% or 1% that don't. And they're the non-delegators. And to be blunt, I would rather we don't even start down that path with them because our model is around we're going to do these things for you if you want something different perhaps we're not right for you. And so our, our engagement process is quite self-filtering. I would say that we are at probably 96 to 98% conversion of the clients that we want. Doesn't mean every client that rings us is someone we want. What are kind of the tests that you use to figure out if they're delegators? So in the meeting, in the meeting craft, what, what's kind of like the, the few of the teasers where you're trying to figure out whether it's a, a couple or a single, if they're genuine delegators? That people acronym is transformative. If you get people to tell you where they live and why they live there, you get people to talk about their hopes for their careers or retirement, tell them about your family, offspring and family, uh, as well as their passions and hobbies. If they're not enjoying that conversation or allowing you to have that conversation- If they're but, closed. Yeah, if they're yeah. closed because they want to, they want you to talk about how you're going to manage the money. They want to talk yeah. about the fees. They want to talk about the returns. Well, guess what? And I, I say this openly, we're actually a bit dull. When it comes to your money, I'm not taking risks. When we bought the RI Newcastle business in 2018, we inherited a bunch of clients with a, with a small direct equity portfolio and wrap accounts, right? And I'm sure that that was done because it made the fees look good. COVID hit in February 29, 2020. Those clients were down 18%, 70 to 75% asset allocation in direct equities, right? The same asset allocation for the model portfolio out of, out of Insignia, and this one I'll give a shout out to Matt Olson. This guy's really, really good. Great muso too. You want to, if you go drinking with him, he'll compose. We're not, song. we're not, we're not including the links of his, of, of, of the, of the pub drinks. But he's made, he'll, he'll compose music at dinner <laughs> okay. and then play it for you that awesome. night. But, uh, those models, same asset allocation plus or minus were down 3% when COVID hit. So our approach here is to, be fairly dull with the way clients manage their money because we don't want them, we don't want them to be worrying about it. So I'll, you know, you draw the, the, the graphs and the pictures, but if the clients are focused on the portfolio, the performance, the technical side, they're not, they don't quite fit us. And I've found that 90, probably 80% of people are delegators. Yeah. And if you can get the delegator right, then you're going to get 96% of them, 98%. Well, I don't know what, what, Sort of engineer whispering you do, but um, to get in to find engineers who are delegators, and they obviously are lots of them, um, I think is the perfect scenario because they'll also ones that will read your stuff. They never leave. Yeah. Well, because I mean, they test you to be blunt. They're testing you to see how smart you are, and they'll keep asking questions until they have no more, and then they're yours for life. Well, let's touch on um, how smart you guys are as a business. Um, you do you have a a, a a advisory board or, or coaching or what's the structure to help you around you going forward? Well, we're, we're happily part of the AZNGA family. So we do have a board of advice or a board, governance board, meets every three months and that's wonderful. I love it and it terrifies me because I'm, these guys are smart. The whole AZ, anyone in AZ is a good crew and I'd, I'd, a real shout out to, to Paul Barrett and Graham McGay and uh, his team. Uh, their teams. The, so what kind of things do they hold you to account? Because for the people listening, some people are aware of uh, AZNGA and some people are not. But for the uninitiated, they, they, they go in and, and they, they work with business owners to, to um, really, really enhance their practice. Yep. So, and, and there's capital involved. But let's put that to a side. Let's talk about what they're doing for you to keep you on the straight and narrow every quarter. So obviously we have very good board reports and you know financials. Is this the first time you've had to report to someone other than yourself? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and that was challenge. Uh, He's yeah. clenching his fist here for everyone yeah. who's not getting the visuals. I'm <laughs> just joking. No, Fitzy Brian Fitz talks about it. That there are there are people that are accountable and people that are responsible. Think of it as a football player. Give me the ball. Trust me, I know what I'm doing with the ball. Monday morning quarterback me. That's something that I've had to learn how to do. 
learn how to actually be accountable for my decisions. They couldn't be more supportive. These guys are very experienced. Graham used to run Count Plus and Paul Barrett obviously has been around the industry forever. But they ask the right questions. I've never found them anything other than supportive. They've got a great team behind me, behind us that help us with M&A opportunities that help us with uh, business model sort of stuff, hiring, um, recruitment, marketing. They've done a huge amount for us. What they haven't done is interfere. You know, they, they, they're not in here telling us how to do this or that. They're, uh, they're a great partner because they, they ask us to have a plan and then we explain the plan and then they back us when we implement it. And it's been, it's been a very good relationship as well as creating, and this is a big thing, as well as creating a succession plan for the business. So they've got the money and they're helping us with, you know, acquisitions and things like that. But they also create the employee share plan where the, uh, the, the smaller partners and the senior people in the business have got a, a, an equity participation plan, which is terrific. And how does that look in your practice? Um, you know, you've got a couple of advisors, some other team. Have you got any other owners in the practice? Well, four, there are four local partners. Right. right. I'm the, I'm the major shareholder locally. AZNJ has, has a large percentage of the business. And then it scales down, I think, from about 14. Sorry, it was 14. It's probably now around about eight or nine, five and about three percent. So you've got price. a, you've got a cohort, um, of people working indeed in the same building who mm-hmm. have a vested interest in making sure yep. that you're making more than you spend, that the risks, of the business as such as client complaints and nil and that the growth and future trajectory is sound, correct? Yes, yes. Thank We're you. all aligned. And, and again, these are talented people, which means we don't agree on everything. But we've got a very healthy – we meet every two weeks with a leadership meeting. It's a leadership advice meeting. And we sit down and we go through an agenda of things that have to change, projects we're working on. Uh, Ryan Muir gave me a book a couple of years ago called 4DX – Four Disciplines of Execution. Now, it's not lightweight reading. If anyone wants to know why they're not getting stuff done in their business, read the book, try to implement it, spend a year learning how to do it wrong, and then the second year you tend to get better. But it's a terrific book for for DX. Or or, or become part of the Ensemble Network and learn from other people's mistakes. That's another way of doing it, everybody. So um, on that, let's talk about the the, the people. So you've you've got not just employees, you've got team members, um, the owners in the business, you've yes. got, uh, which means you've got people around you. You've also then got people holding you to account. You've got a corporate rigor, That's true. um, which is making sure that there's no imperceptible drift. Mm-hmm. You've got a real purpose around the clients, but, but maybe get a feel for, you know, I'd like to know, you know, why people join your business, um, mm-hmm. why, why they stay and, and why they grow. So, so why would someone, um, uh, join your business? What sort of person would come into your, your orbit in, in the local area or indeed remotely? Um, and um, yeah. We've got a good story to tell there. Uh, if you look at Heather, who's worked with Heather's in her 70s now, she does some back office accounts and, and client reporting. She's been here 24 years. My partner Chris has been about 22 years. Louise, our power planning manager, 17. Ryan and Steve have been here, I think, about 11 and 15 years or something like that. Olga's been here 10 years. Uh, Courtney, five. So the, the people tend to stick. And I largely put that down to two factors. One, we really are people oriented, right? Uh, Olga said the other day. But people say that all the time. So, so but, but the, the maths of what you've just told me is staggering. It's 100 years, right? In what yeah. you just said. Yeah. So, some people say they're people focused and they've got turnover every six months. Yes. So what do you mean by people focused on the ground? The best story I've got is a, a, a lady named Rosemary I ran into in the pharmacy across the road uh, a couple of days ago. She left us as a client three years ago. She had an account balance run down. We looked after her for 15 years, but she left us as a client. But Olga was still helping her with a Centrelink problem because they're older and they were confused about Centrelink. And Olga came up, and Rosemary came into the office about six months ago and gave Olga a box of chocolates or something like that. And Olga came up stairs and she was bouncing. She was on air. She, and if you know her, she's Polish. It's not her style to be chirpy, but she, she was absolutely delightful. I said, what, what are you so happy about? She said, oh, I just helped Rosemary. She's such a lovely lady. I love that we can help people like that. Now, what I heard was, one, she enjoyed it, but two, she's got the delegated authority to do some pro bono work mm-hmm. for people that she cares about because 
she knows that our job is to actually help people. She didn't ask permission for anyone to do pro bono work. She didn't ask her. She just did it because she knew how to do it efficiently and she knew it was going to be okay. And my all I've ever said, I've never set financial targets for any of the advisors here. So I often call this place a, a, a socialist collective. All I've ever said is do your job properly. Just do everything you're going to say for the clients. And we, we know that because at the moment I think we had – 23 referrals in in March alone. So I think for a socialist collective, having a 40% increase in the size of your client base, um, you're running a pretty neat variation on, on the socialist perspective. It's it's like if I look at all these guys, they're all incredibly ethical. Paul, who's joined us as a, as a partner in the last few years, very caring guy, really honours the commitment he makes to his clients. So uh, all I've ever said to the clients, but to you've the built staff the structure. Is, yes, you built yeah. the engine room so that people who exist in that 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 kind of state of mind can actually also achieve financially for the company and for themselves. Because you've you're getting them to do the things that they're really good at, and you're removing them <laughs> from the things that they 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 shouldn't be doing. There's an old story about Dick Smith who said, "If you want to make a million dollars." Find a shop that's giving bad service and open up next door and service the daylights out of the clients. So because this is two sides of that, one, we really do – the simple rule is if you say you're going to do it, do it, right? And if you're not going to do it, call the client and tell them it's not happening or get someone to help you. But don't drop the ball. Just yep. don't. Now, we built – the threads and the, the workflow management processes, and we've got the checklists up the wazoo and all that sort of stuff. But one of the other things we've done very well is, and this started with the fee fee for service sort of work we do, of we've, which half your team sound like they were here in two thousand and seven to an extent. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I think it was the thirteen or fourteen in the team, mm. and we've grown and shrunk a little bit over the years, but it's growing now. Uh, the we, we've got these four service packages, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum, right? What we do with those clients, with those service packages, is very well defined. Each of the staff know exactly what's what the clients are entitled to, and they also know when they're allowed to do a little extra without getting too much. And if the client is too demanding, they'll go to the advisor and say, you've got to have a chat with them. They either pay more or they ask less. And that is guided by primarily the client service team. But one of the other things we do as part of our review process, we put those four service packages on the on the screen with the dollar amount attached to each service offer, along with the services they're entitled to. So there's a table goes up on the screen and we say to the client, you're on gold, we think you should stay there for these reasons or you might want to and it's it's quite weird. I don't I can't remember a single client ever downgrading a service level. It's always the advisor saying, look, I don't think they need to be on gold. I want to push them down to silver, which is straight out of the FASIA playbook that we, we've got to identify what we charge and what we do, and we've got to be ethically comfortable that that's right. And so t- to answer why do the people stay, why do they come? Because my guys are honest and ethical, and we actually have a business model that actually honours that. I know that sounds a little bit highfalutin. And, but and, and how do you think? So you mentioned that you're getting some assistance with mergers and, and acquisitions. Mm-hmm. So how is that going to play out when you're bringing people in all at once? This is going to be tough. Oh, mate, that's a magic question. How do I assess the culture of someone I'm talking to? And, mate, that's lots of coffee, lots of chats. Uh, when Paul came in with his client book a, a few years ago, I'd known Paul for many years. We'd played soccer together and I'd judged him to be one of us, if that right. makes sense. Right. And his clients, it's interesting when Ryan came back, but it, it, it is quite interesting when you, when you bring these clients in, this has been our experience, our service levels are so much higher than the classic financial advisor who simply sends a report, talks to the client about technical things that the clients either don't care about or don't understand. Well, we talk to them about their family and their children and their holidays and their cars and their renovations on their house. And that is the center of our conversation. And we have found over and over again that clients, when they understand the service that's available, when they understand the conversation we have, we explain the fees openly and honestly and then say, look, if you enjoyed that, that's available at this service level. And the clients almost universally, and I'm, I'm thinking about the, the our Newcastle book we acquired, we were seeing 100%, 200% fee upgrades from clients that were used to an investment conversation rather than a 
people. Well, you're, you're meeting the market. You're giving them what they what the, what they want rather mm-hmm. than what you think they yeah. want. Now, when you with, with your actual uh, your team, um, you've got two offices. Do you have a work from home or a hybrid policy at all? We do. Uh, we particularly post COVID, there's a few that wanted to work from home. There's a few that did not. They don't like working work home. Uh, one of our client service managers, she lives two hours north of here. Yep. So she comes down once a month. Yep. Um, so people can work from home one day a week. We have a roster day off policy as well. So once a month, people can work extra hours and take time off. So it's it's all about adapting to be that employer of choice. And given that that's the case, you, what, what do you, you mentioned you have a, a fortnightly uh, sort of leadership meeting. What other meeting cadences do you have in your office? And I'm assuming that uh, given the previous answer, you, you you have electronic meetings like Microsoft Teams or Zoom as mm-hmm. well. So mm-hmm. maybe sort of what are the cadences of the meeting for the engine room? Right. And and what's the general format? That so you the, the workflow management threads out of X-Plan create uh, task lists for everybody. The client service managers run those meetings with the advisors once a week. Yep. So and once a week they're, 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 they're getting their client service manager escalating up to the advisor. Yes. To, so the to, advisor has to either be there physically yep. in the room or via Zoom. And they're giving feedback okay. on current state and also yes. um, gives the advisor an opportunity to to inquire as to where the capacity and capability is yes. in their in their division. Yep. 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 Okay, good. good. And uh, I think they, they also do that with the uh, – with their client service officers, so the four, four team members yep. so, uh, are talking to the CSM all the time. But I think pragmatically there are probably uh, – I know there's at least one task meeting a week in the client service team, but probably two in each pod. Yep. Uh, that, so that that's happening. The – our general manager, Kate, is part of a general admin meeting once a week where they, they air issues and yep. look for systematic stuff. And uh, Kate also does what she calls her check-ins with people once a fortnight or once a month, depending on you know, how difficult the advisor is to pin down. They, the girls call them the therapy sessions where they unload on Kate and, and her job is to look for thematics and fix them. But So we've got a very regular check-in framework where the the communication is structured and happening. Well, if you don't communicate, you're in trouble, right? So, yeah. um, and then in that, I mean, so you've, you've, you've mentioned a lot about your, your client service officers, the client service mm-hmm. managers. You mentioned a lot about Kate. I've got a question I like to ask around, um, you know, training mm-hmm. and the training for your advisors is obvious. You know, it's, it's along the lines of CPD points and whatnot. I don't know if you do, but, but do you do any training for the other members of your team? And if you had a magic wand, and you were speaking to an organisation who had a considerable share of the market being ensemble, what kind of things would you recommend that that, that the industry get behind to help with practice managers, um, uh, client service officers, et cetera? Wow, small question. So, yes, they have a training framework. Uh, we recently hired a terrific lady, uh, Crystal. It's one of the things you talk about recruitment. I, I have great faith in girls, or often girls, but people that were restaurant managers. They're very good at managing in chaos, which is not a bad description of how this place runs at the time because clients make it chaotic, right? I'm watching the show The Bear, so uh, it's, it's, if it's anything like that, then good God. Yeah. So Crystal's, Crystal's landed really well, but it's, it's quite interesting because some of the advisors have started tasking Crystal, you know, please do this and, and prepare that and do that sort of stuff. And uh, I was delighted. The, I got feedback from two people going, leave her alone. We have a whole training program. We are teaching her the job week by week, and you're asking her to do things that she hasn't been trained in yet. Please copy us in if you're going to do that or send the work to the CSM and so that she can judge whether Crystal's capable. And Crystal, who is a is a very intelligent uh, woman, is is just eating it up because she's being trained in a structured way. So we learn that's to- your training. That's what you've done, and, and yes. credit to you, right? And you obviously do a lot right to keep people in the business yes. that long. Um, if 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 what would you? What do you think the industry should should? Oh, do needs to a lean certificate in? three in in uh, client management, financial planning management. We need a TAFE course, like a, 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 like a, like they do in like a certificate, which then be, we need a career path for. The engine room. It's part Absolutely. of my passion. It's the reason I signed up to, to do this. Um, and, you know, a, a, a certificate as an entry point. You mentioned you, you've done some work in the education cap plan before, mm-hmm. broadly mm-hmm. the education. Um, and that would be, that would give a minimum standard to the engine room. And if ASIC's all concerned about minimum standards, then the person who deals with the client actually volumize more 
Totally. Hours than the advisor totally. probably needs to have some some rigor around yeah, what they I, do. I would love to see uh, a sort of DFP level, maybe TAFE level sort of course. That's an idea I kicked around with my daughter Kate. That if she ever got sick of working for someone, she could build a framework. Sounds sounds like where Ensemble's going, where you are training and, and accrediting client service officers who walk into it understanding super, understanding tax, understanding. X plan, understanding workflow management, understanding how to manage diaries and liaise with clients in a structured way. It's a whole skill set. We're just uh, the whole industry skewed on product advice. It, it's, it's, it's the engine room that matters. And we were talking about this with the CEO the other day, Pete Ornsby, that the, the first person, and this is where VBP has such an opportunity and I think is doing well to come up with a best practice model for how you should run your business. And that includes operating threads and operating frameworks and reporting guidelines in the in the engine room side, as well as service packages and you know processes to produce ROAs and SOAs. Look, I completely agree. And and there's the theory and put presenting the theory, but you still need the people and and you know, when I look at what what uh, team members want, they want don't have to be remunerated properly in good culture, mm-hmm. but they want a genuine intellectual career path. Yes. And I just feel there's a, just a, a yawning gap um, in in our industry, financial services for those other people. So yet again, we might look to take this conversation up um, in another field, but, uh, you know, Cert 3, Cert 4, whatever whatever, whatever you do um, would be a, a, fant- a fantastic thing. And um, Could you I imagine might- if someone knock on your door saying, I've just finished or I'm about to finish my Cert 3 in financial planning admin? That girl wouldn't be wouldn't be allowed, or girl or guy, right? Uh, wouldn't be allowed out the front door before she got a job offer these days. That's right. And look, full disclosure, I'm, I'm involved in, in virtual business partners, and um, it's something that we we uh, we've been doing for a long time. But we we did that because we wanted to be able to demonstrate competency yep. um, for people. But um, we've often um, we've often wondered that it should be something um, more universal. Now, I also let me change some gears. You mentioned that um, a, a bit of a pro bono, and and um, quite a lot of practices uh, have a, sort of a charitable style of thing. And 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 you can either you know donate time or money. So you've just mentioned that you do allow. Um, pro bono work, which is which is donating. Let's be brutally honest, because it's 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 time. Mm-hmm. What what other charitable um, or how do you have a structure for that? Yes, we do. The it's pro bono is a, a, a I won't say a soft spot or a sore spot. I've tried several times over the years to get a genuine pro bono framework up with the university, with the Salvation Army, and the legislative framework we work in makes it so hard to do it. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Because so, um, it's. It's just hard. Yeah, it's just hard. You've got to document everything instead of giving it. Perhaps under quality of advice, it's going to get better. We'll see. But the this this office supports the the Smith family as a as an office, but also the the team members get to make a donation every year to the charity of their choice. It's a, it's a part of their package, I guess you call it that. Oh, wonderful! Where, so is that is that is it a set time of the year? Is yeah, it, yeah, it reviews. So we're coming up to now. I think it's it's up to five hundred dollars per person. I think you've you've got to work five years to get five hundred dollars. Yeah. But the, the the guys have. I'm I'm a big fan of Salvation Army. I ran the the Red Shield appeal locally for many years here. It's, it's terrific, and we support Carrie's place here locally, which is a, a battered you know refuge for domestic violence. Uh, I know Olga. Uh, it was very passionate about uh, rescue animals and things like that. Mm-hmm. And so each of the, the the guys get to direct some money every year to a charity of their choice. Awesome. Awesome. And um, and look, all of these things go into the thread of, of the people side of, of the business. Um, and you've even got a structure for your charitable giving in case that, you know, people didn't pick up on that. You've got – it's a 10-year based and you've got a, a structure mm-hmm. there. So even though you can be a charismatic um, leader and, and CEO, the, the, the ones that actually benefit and get scale end up putting that framework almost behind every single decision they make when they walk yeah. in the door. Yeah. So the employee value propositions are a hot discussion in this business at the moment uh, as we try to identify – in a world where people can go anywhere, let's be honest, there's a talent competition. Well, as we speak, we're 3% unemployment and yeah. I have a feeling that, um, that that's actually lower than that for people who were in financial services. There is no talent. So, sorry, that's poorly put. 
Well, well, we won't even edit that out. We'll just say that Andrew Rock stuffs up from time to time. Yeah. How's that sound, Kieran? Yeah, the, the pool but, of talent's a bit thin. Right? Yeah, okay, oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I've got my ghostwriter. Um, the, the reality is, is that you need that invo- You need to have an, invo- an employee value proposition that doesn't send you broke because it's not all about money. Mm. It's about identifying um, you know, the careers because people want careers, not jobs. So in that sense, one of the things is getting a shout out to Chris Neal. He has been the culture captain of this place for the last 20 years. So every month we sit down, we have our staff meeting, but then we spend two hours playing board games. And every three months we go on an offsite and we go and do something, whitewater rafting or um, quad bike riding or learning to surf or barefoot bowls. You might want to get that insurance specialist in, <laughs> in the practice pretty quickly. <laughs> but and I know particularly with VBP because Courtney Nichols uh, has been a great part of the leadership team. She's the one that made VBP work for us by by engaging our uh, our two VBP people, Dan and Kai in the Philippines. They are they talk with them daily, but they play games with them every week. Half an hour at the end of every Friday, they're sitting down playing online games. We're sending them little gifts all the time. And Courtney is in many ways a den mother there uh, and has really made the VBP experience work for us to the point. And we haven't talked about numbers, but I'll, I'll throw a couple in there, right? We got the 40% uptick, but f- I did the numbers the other day on on what it costs for us to get a review prep because we're very standardized there. Between 10 and $15 for them to, re- to prepare a full review. And for them to do a switch ROA or withdrawal or rebalance costs $10 afterwards. Right? You get 25 bucks to, to have the review prep done and then the ROA prepared and dispatched to the client afterwards. is That's, that's a brilliant cost thing. And, and to do that, you've got to have people want to stay. You've got to have people caring for the people and you've got to have the systems working. And Courtney has been terrific at helping us get that. A oh, big shout out to Courtney. Um, absolutely. And the engine room, um, you know, I mentioned before the podcast that quite often I talk with the general managers or practice managers, but quite often I'm talking to the owner who's just, who's put in one in the last couple of years, like you had with Kate. And I really want to appeal to, you know, the reason why you've done that. And we've touched on that today. And if you were to put your sort of operational hat on on the business of the business, I'd love to hear about where you see sort of the the industry going, not from a client perspective necessarily, but from how we arrange our, our businesses and what's going to work for all of the stakeholders, one being the general public, the other one being the owners, et cetera. So where well, do you see it? Again, small question. Honestly, I think the business breaks into two types. You either have a business at scale, which is probably turning over 2 million plus that can afford to build the systems and runs on excellent systems. You then have the alternative practice, which is somewhere between 500 and a million in turnover, which you call it a small family practice, very much a lifestyle practice where it's able to run on really intelligent people with decent systems, but you take that person out, the whole thing grinds to a halt. So the first thing is we're headed into a scale scenario or we're going to be specialist boutique lifestyle practices. And you can see that happening everywhere right now. The The next thing, I'm, I'm rather excited and twitchy, but excited about quality of advice because the the call center solution is going to be, well, why would you pay a financial advisor? We can give you advice for free, but it's going to translate into product advice and holistic advice. So right now I'm focusing on the marketing conversation around identifying the client experience that we provide here, create our own voice on social media and LinkedIn and all those sort of things so that clients can happily deal with their industry fund if they want to, and say, no, it's time for me to get someone that's more invested in me. Give them some fact-based choosing. Yeah, rather just than create the differentiation correct. point. Yep. Uh, the, the, the other things that I think are really exciting, uh, we're going to see, and we're seeing it everywhere, where the AFSLs are buying into the advice margin. So we're going to see a lot of AFSLs taking a piece of their practices, which is going to be interesting for the smaller businesses that they don't necessarily want to partner with. So that piece is already happening. It's part of the AZ story, but you're seeing in a lot of the majors around town. And probably the, the, the next piece that I'm pumped about, and I'm having a meeting with uh, uh, Jay Beckton from Plan Logic after this conversation, Roxy, where we're talking about AI and how we're going to be able to use AI to create a safe advice model. So in many ways, it's it's a fairly simple thing. You just give it a thousand really good files and it's going to be able to create an auditing framework that allows you to go, hey, that's a good file you've just done, but you missed these two things. 
make sure it's in your file note, or it's going to give the auditors a very easy path of auditing 100% of your files. Yep. So we're headed, and I think fairly quickly, to 100% audit of our client files. Uh, that's oh, pro- be- it'll be proactive auditing, real-time proactive audit. Yeah, it, it's, it's going to be a piece of cake for the systems to do it. Yeah. So if you're a PI or insurer out there, maybe the, the premiums can start heading south, please? Possibly, you can only hope so. But this is one of those ones you've got to lean into this. If you think the change is over, you're kidding, for yourself, kidding yourself. Maybe the legislative pressure is off for a bit and we're going to get some tailwinds, but the – the old school way is not going to last. Within five years, it's going to be a very different industry again. And it's going to be exciting, but it's going to be 200, 250 or more clients per advisor, not 125. That's right. And serviced well. And, and yes. if you, you know, people who you mentioned there, technology, well, the iPhone came out in 2007. You know, the Apple, Apple, Apple watches, which I know you're wearing today. And, 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 you know, things like Google Maps, all of these things that, that they, they used to not exist, everyone. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, um, uh, so it'll be a tectonic shift. And, and look, we're really, we're really pumped for it here at, at Ensemble. And, and, mm. and part of what the sharing of this engine room is, is, there are people out there who uh, are thinking of doing things, but they just need to hear a few other people in the mm. industry who are also thinking that way, and that will give them the confidence to but go out and do it. If if we're, we're having that kind of conversation and someone's sitting here going, okay, I need to start to improve things, the first thing I would say is start to outsource. Start to outsource. We went to VBP, terrific. The other partner we have, which have been brilliant, is Plan Logic. Perfect. And I'd give a real shout out to to, to Plan Logic and Jay Beckton in particular has been a real partner. We were forced to learn how to hand over efficiently, which forced us to change our file notes, which forced us to create a power planning manager who acts as a filter. And bit by bit, we got the dumb stuff out of the process and it started to work and it released. Our, our volume of SOAs quadrupled when we got through the the, the outsourced plan, plan logic process. And you were given guidance by your licensee, is that correct? To go to plan logic? Yeah, well, as part of looking at outsourcing or what, what brought you into doing that? Look again, a shout out to Joseph, Joseph Arout. Joey's really bought into this. The licensee has supported the outsource journey big time. And so, yes, they, they've got that vision, which is good. But it was one of those ones where it was an idea on the shelf that we could grab. Once you grab it, it's not just a matter of going click, tick the switch. You have to lean in for six months to learn how to make it work for you. And Jay, Jay will often talk from Plan Logic about conversations we have that led him to modify the way they their electronic submission documents because I was pushing him to go, mate, I don't care what you need. This is the way I need to give it to you. So it was real partnership between us that improved things. And I know that that if you if you look at it and say, say you're doing 50 SOAs a year and each SOA is worth $5,000 to the practice, if you can double the number of SOAs, you've, just, you've unlocked value in your business. Well, we didn't double it. We quadrupled it. We unlocked a massive amount of value in the business. This is the the advice that advisors sometimes leave on the shelf because they know it's going to take eight weeks to get an SOA done and they've got other ones that they have to do and so they leave stuff on the shelf. You partner properly, you're going to unlock tremendous value and make it more efficient and you'll get 40% more clients. So what you're saying is is that you know, the engine room and getting it right and, and, and having people in your practice who are coming on that journey. So if you're a practice out there and you've got a couple of people in your practice, uh, before you go out and, and, and look to try and make all of these, these things happen, you really need to have a talk with your business partners. Yes. And you've got to get the context of why you're going to do things. Because if you're not on the same page, all of these things, whether it be, be outsourcing or technology or, or threads, um, you'll end up being how you used to be. We had four different models with four different advisors, and 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 so that would be my my advice to to uh, small practices. The other one is, um, you know, you've mentioned uh, a, a a person who's who's been instrumental, Joe, um, from your licensee. The classic what what they used to be called business development or practice managers. Um, I would say lean into these people. Yes. Um, they they are there. They are skilled, and the best thing that 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 these individuals all across licenses and business coaches have is perspective of other clients. Absolutely. Okay, they get to see what other people are doing because 
we're not the sole arbiter of brilliance. No. Uh, and I couldn't agree with you more. You need – and that's another value of the outsource partners. They're seeing multiple businesses. Oh, yeah, I get and to see lots the, of stuff. The ensemble thing, <laughs> the, the VBP thing, the plan logic thing, the RBMs, you're Correct. right. They, 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 you don't need to lay the road in front of you. What you need to do is to commit to changing. And then you've got to – it's a, it's a great quote, you know, the, the sacred cows make the best, best burgers. You're going to have to give something up. Okay, have you written a book on that one? Because I don't really want to see the, 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 the print version of that. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's all good. Well, Gil, it's been a, it's been a real pleasure to talk about uh, your journey, to talk about your beliefs, to, to touch on um, the work and the passion that you have around the client engagement, um, the, the, the estate planning, the intergenerational. Um, you know, how I can see how people have stayed with – with you and, and and now it's not just the Gill Show anymore with the business. Um, uh, for those people out there, uh, Gil, Gil is your, you know if you just met him, um, you would think he's a he's a classic powerful entrepreneur and he is, but he's also smart enough to have partnered with another company who holds him to account, mm-hmm. which in reality means that businesses go through these cycles of growth and decline, growth and decline. And the 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 element that you need to make sure that you, you, you limit the decline is bringing in people, mm-hmm. bringing in people around you and holding accountability. There's an, easy, there's an easy way to identify when you need to partner with people is when you hit the wall. When you're so damn busy and revenue is not growing and you've got the same problem occurring over and over again, that's where something's got to give. And that's the, the partnership with your licensee or with the VBPs or the plan logics. You've got to do something different. And in my case, it was the Gill Show a few years ago, and that was a wall. And nowadays, the majority of the new clients don't meet me, right? And it, uh, it, it's, a ter- it's a much better business model because it gives me the freedom to work four days a week, right? And take 12 weeks a, week, a year off and things like that. But the, the machine still runs itself. On that last quote, the machine, I'm going to thank you very much for being on the Engine Room podcast, Gil. Um, It's been very informative and um, we look forward for new chapters and I'm sure we'll talk about them in the future. Cheers, mate. Take care.